Hi everyone, this is Jermaine. I'm from Alibaba Cloud. Today we have with us James and Jeremy from the Academy side uh, to host the next uh, one hour session. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Jeremy. Okay, hello and welcome. I'm Jeremy Peterson. I'm one of your two hosts for today. The other host will be my colleague, James Fitzgerald. The two of us are from Alibaba Cloud's Academy team, hence the t-shirt. Uh, we're both located in Hangzhou, China. And again, today's topic is jump-starting innovation through AI. So I'd like to break this talk into three parts. First, I'll introduce you to Alibaba Cloud. That's the first part. In the second part, I will introduce you to some of the AI applications and capabilities that we have. So these are things we do internally at, as part of Alibaba Group. And then finally, I'll show you how you can use our platform for AI or Pi to build your own AI applications. That will be a very short demo, but it should give you a taste of what's possible. So let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, welcome to Alibaba Cloud plus AI. Let's go ahead and get started. So I'll start by introducing Alibaba Cloud, as I said before. Uh, we'll take a look at some of Alibaba Cloud's own AI capabilities in part two. And then in part three, we'll take a look at the Alibaba Cloud platform for AI, or Pi. So let's start out with a very, very simple introduction to Alibaba Cloud itself. So who is Alibaba Group? I'm sure some of you already know Alibaba. Alibaba Cloud is essentially the cloud computing services arm of Alibaba Group. But of course, the group is, is very large. It includes a lot of businesses. Alibaba Group itself is a relatively old business uh, now. It's already more than 20 years old. It was started in 1999 by Jack Ma and the original uh, 18 founders. At that point, it was basically just a wholesale platform to sell Chinese goods to businesses outside of China. But since then, we've expanded into a huge number of other areas. In 2003, Taobao.com was launched. Uh, that's essentially a, a, a two-customer or customer-facing online retail uh, site. Alipay was launched to process payments in 2004. In 2007, Alimama was started to help Taobao merchants advertise better. So Alimama is essentially our internal advertising tool to help you reach your customers on Taobao. In 2008, Tmall came of age, came online. So Tmall is essentially an upscale Taobao. You can think of it that way. So Tmall, Tmall stores are typically owned by name brands. So if you wanted to buy like Gucci or Louis Vuitton or an Apple Watch or something, you'd probably get that on Tmall. Whereas if you wanted to buy like paper towels or cooking oil or, you know, some, some cheaper electronic products, battery chargers, you'd probably go to Taobao for that. Um, E-commerce is still the core of our business, uh, but obviously we've since expanded in a big way into payments through Alipay and Ant Financial, and also into logistics and computing through Alibaba Cloud and Tainiao, which is our logistics arm. And we keep growing, we get bigger and bigger all the time. There are a lot of other smaller business units that I won't go into detail about um, for all sorts of things ranging from supermarket goods to uh, home delivery. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff that Alibaba Group is doing. And underpinning all of these other businesses is Alibaba Cloud and Alibaba Cloud's computing infrastructure services and also AI and machine learning services, which is what we're here to talk about today. So Alibaba Cloud itself is, in fact, a worldwide, a world-scale cloud provider. So we have 23 regions around the world, 69 availability zones. An availability zone, or an AZ, is essentially a data center. So you could say we have 69 data centers around the world, not just in China, but also in other parts of Southeast Asia, in Australia, in the Middle East, in India, in Europe, and in the United States. So wherever you're located, we probably have a data center near you. And in addition to that data center presence, we also have a strong CDN presence. We have 2,800 plus CDN nodes around the world, spanning more than 70 countries. There are more than a million customers on Alibaba Cloud, and we have 
more than 10 million virtual CPU cores worth of compute capacity deployed and tens of exabytes of storage. So it's a big, big platform. So what are our AI capabilities specifically? Let's move away from looking at infrastructure and towards focusing on AI. So Alibaba Group itself is a data-driven business. Our core business is, of course, e-commerce. Uh, but besides that, we have a variety of these other supporting businesses like Tainel for logistics, Yoku for media, Alimama for advertising. All of these businesses, in order to function well, depend on data. So all of these businesses, Taobao, Tmall, Alipay, all of them need to do customer and vendor analysis to make business decisions and to optimize the platforms to make them better and easier to use for our customers. And to do that, we have a variety of what we call data apps that are applications we use internally at the company that are driven by the data we collect from our customer-facing uh, businesses like Tmall, Taobao, and Alipay. So we collect data about customers and about transactions from those platforms. We store that inside Alibaba Cloud, and then we make that data available to internal users through these data apps. Um, the data apps are, are essentially low-code or no-code interfaces for non-developers to use. So if you're some, someone like a product designer or a marketing person, you'd use a data app to interact with Alibaba Cloud's uh, internal data. Uh, those data apps sit on top of a platform we call DataWorks, which is in the dark blue band toward the bottom of my slide here. DataWorks is where actual de data development goes on. So data loading, extraction, processing, and analysis is typically done in DataWorks by our data developers. So of course, at this level, you're writing some SQL code to actually run queries. And then the code that you write in DataWorks runs on our big data engines. We actually have our own proprietary uh, offline data analytics system, which we call Max Compute. Um, it's sort of like, you can think of Max Compute as being like a, a combination of Hadoop HDFS plus Hive, all rolled into one. It's uh, a little bit faster than, than uh, traditional open source Hadoop, and it has better data compression, uh, but it, it works in a similar way. So if you're familiar with Hive SQL, then you'd be very comfortable using Max Compute. And we use Max Compute for most of our offline processing, but we also do real-time computing with Flink, and we also support managed Hadoop through our EMR service. You can also, of course, run HBase, Spark, whatever open source tools you want, and we do have teams running those as well. And then once this data is all processed, we'll typically feed it into Pi, the platform for AI, which is what we use to build and train machine learning models. We'll be talking about that more later. The point I really want to drive home here is that the value that we derive from our data is the core of our business. So yes, of course, our e-commerce platforms have a high GMV, a high gross merchandise value, a lot of transactions happening, but why do people want to use Tmall and Taobao? Why do people like these platforms? Why do people use AliExpress? It's because they've been optimized to make the vendor and customer experience better. How was the optimization done? Using the data we've collected in combination with AI and machine learning techniques. So we're always looking for ways to take our data and turn it into applications that can help consumers and help our own internal users here at Alibaba Group. A good example of that is face-based payments. So in China, this is a very popular thing. There's actually a vending machine not far from my desk uh, where you can scan your face to unlock the door of the vending machine and then take out whatever drinks and snacks you want. And then when you close the door, the machine will uh, calculate how much you owe and it will match your face to your Chinese ID card and then automatically take the money out of your Alipay account. You don't even need to have your phone or your wallet with you. The camera on the vending machine will actually just figure out who you are directly. And it works even with heavy makeup, different hairstyles, it works even if you're wearing a hat. It's a very sophisticated ID system. Uh, actually, if you go to a KFC in China, you can, you can use this system too. Uh, we have a partnership with KFC now to deploy these face recognition kiosks. So this is an example of us using uh, user data uh, in, in, in an application with uh, machine learning uh, to create a new application. So we've basically taken user data, paired it with our, our, our machine learning capabilities and come up with this new way to pay for things. Uh, another area where we make heavy use of machine learning and AI internally is for image search. So on Taobao and Tmall, 
you can actually pull out your phone, open up the app, uh, and then there's a little camera icon. Uh, and if you click on that, or if you tap on that with your finger, it will open up this interface where you can scan items. Um, and it works even in cluttered and noisy environments. Uh, as you can see on the left here, there's actually two different shoes in this picture. It will pick out the one that's in the foreground automatically, and then it will find similar products for you on Tmall or Taobao. I've even tried it out on, on people, on some of my colleagues, with their permission, of course. And if I take a photograph of a person, it will identify the item of clothing that they're wearing and find similar items in the store. So this is a, a great way to make shopping easier because you no longer need to know exactly how to describe what you're shopping for. So if you're shopping for something that's difficult to describe, uh, maybe because it's not a common item, uh, image search is a good way to find similar items to what you want. If you're shopping for something like clothing, where there's a lot of variation, uh, small variation in, in style, like the, the color of the clothing or the, or the shape of the sleeves on a dress, uh, again, image search can be easier than actually trying to come up with the right keywords. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me stop here, actually, and pull up a video. I made a video earlier to show you how this works. Let me just play that here. So I want to demonstrate one of these AI capabilities to you in a real life scenario. So I'm here in a meeting room in Hangzhou. I've got my phone, I've opened up Taobao, and I've got this water bottle. And let's say that I'm interested in buying this water bottle on Taobao. Well, I could try to describe it. I, I could say that it's, it's a blue bottle with a red hook, or I could say that it's a sport water bottle, but it'd be very difficult for me to describe exactly what this is in words, and that's where image search comes in. So let's go ahead and scan this bottle and see what kind of results I get. So I'll go ahead into the Taobao app uh, and I'll scan this bottle using the Taobao search function and we'll see if we can find similar ones on Taobao. So I click on the little picture icon and then I take a picture of the bottle and sure enough I find nearly identical bottles right away. How cool is that? Okay, so this is another area where we're using AI, AI customer service. This example here is actually from Lazada. So well, Lazada is now a part of Alibaba Group. It's a retail platform in Southeast Asia. I'm sure most of you already know that already. But anyway, uh, Lazada is using our NLP system, our natural language processing system, to produce a context-aware customer service bot. So you can see, you can ask it things like, what is store credit? Where is my order? Um, if you're not logged in, it will ask you to enter some details to find your order, and then it will pull the orders up and display them in this nice little mini app uh, that's built into the Lazada cell phone app. So this is a cool application of AI to customer service scenarios. Besides Lazada, we actually also use this um, for Tmall and Taobao. I don't have a demo of that here because it's all in Chinese and I wanted to do my talk today in English. But if you open up Tmall or Taobao, you'll, ta or, Tmall or Taobao, you'll see that there's a similar uh, function in there to this. Um, most of the customer service uh, at Alibaba Group, the first tier is actually done by AI. Um, and that applies both for text-based customer support and phone-based customer support. So we have systems for uh, speech to text and text to speech that allow our natural language processing platform to work uh, via voice. So both via textual and a voice-based interface. Uh, and, and this is something we use not just ourselves, we've actually made this available as a tool called Dian Xiaomi, meaning something like store clerk or, or, or store secretary. And this Dian Xiaomi uh, is, is in use on the Xiaomi store, the Apple store, the Nike store, a couple of other big brands across Alibaba's e-commerce platforms. We have about 200,000 shops using this AI customer service tool. And this saves us internally an enormous amount of customer support work. Something like 90% of customer queries can be answered directly by the bots without any human interact intervention required. We're also looking at ways to apply what we've learned uh, from our retail business to scenarios outside of Alibaba Group. One such scenario in China is the city brain. So I live in Hangzhou. We actually do have a city brain deployed in Hangzhou. What is it? It's essentially our big data and AI platform 
but running on the local government's private computers uh, that they have requisitioned. Uh, we've set the system up for them, and what it does is it collects information from the cellular network, from GPSs and public transit and, and, and uh, trucks, uh, it collects information from CCTV cameras, so the, the, the cameras that are watching the intersections and, and sections of highway, and it even can talk to the traffic light. So after collecting all of this data, the system is able to make decisions about how to alter traffic light timings to achieve lower congestion. So actually, Hangzhou, if you've ever visited Hangzhou, you'll know that the traffic is quite bad, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a lot better than it used to be. Uh, I think there's a 10 or 15% speed up in terms of traffic flow in the center of the city now as a consequence of traffic light timing changes that were suggested by the city brain. So the city brain will send updated timings to the local city authorities and they can choose to accept them or not. Um, after accepting the, the timings that were proposed by city brain, traffic flow did improve. And of course, there's a lot of other applications of this that we're still exploring. Um, having this CCTV camera data allows us to use our computer vision system to do things like detect accidents, uh, and then we can alert the police that there's an accident at an interse intersection so that they can go there and then help deal with it. Uh, we also have a system, I think it's called Green Channel, which allows ambulances to pass through uh, traffic lights without having to wait. So basically, um, in advance of the ambulance arriving at an intersection, there's already a green light in the direction the ambulance needs to go. So City Brain can adjust the lights for emergency vehicles to help make sure they have a clear path to wherever they need to go. Um, this here is just an example of uh, a, a typical City Brain visual dashboard that you would see if you were a city employee in charge of monitoring traffic. So you can see there's a lot of metrics on here, temperature, weather, um, traffic rate, uh, 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 traffic throughput, so rate of flow for, for vehicles, uh, map of, of intersections, areas where there's lower and higher congestion. You have all of that at your fingertips as a, as a city manager, say, in Hangzhou. Um, and here's just an example of this system. Let me see if I can get this video to play. So this is an example of the computer vision system that we have in use as part of the city brain. You can see it gives a rating at each intersection for how likely it is there's a traffic jam there. It draws a bounding box uh, on top of each vehicle that uh, changes to a darker shade of red the longer the vehicle is sitting there, which can help to indicate whether or not there's a traffic jam. And in addition to that, if you look on the right, in addition to judging congestion, uh, we can also count different types of vehicles, so cars, trucks, and scooters. Uh, look at the trajectory of each vehicle. Um, so if there's an issue with the way an intersection is designed, we can, we can make adjustments based on, say, how vehicles commonly make a left or right-hand turn. Uh, maybe there's something that could be optimized there. Um, and of course, it can also do things like license plate reading so that we can actually track vehicles as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and have a quick demo of Platform for AI. Let me show you how our Pi system actually works. Obviously, some of the capabilities I've just discussed are limited to the city brain or to internal usage at Alibaba Group, but you can still do a lot with Pi. So let's see a simple example. Okay, so let's take a look in the Alibaba Cloud console and see what features the platform for AI offers. So the first thing I'm going to do from the home page here, alibabacloud.com, is go click on this console button in the upper right hand corner here, and that should take me over into the console. Uh, I've already logged in. If you haven't logged in, when you click on the console button, you'll first be prompted to enter your username and password, but I already did that, so I can just go directly into the console. Uh, once I'm in the console, I need to navigate over to Platform for AI. So to do that, I'll click on this orange button in the upper left, uh, mouse over products and services, that opens up a search bar, and then I can search for Pi, P-A-I, and it will show up down here uh, under Machine Learning Platform for AI, which is the full name for Pi. And if I click on that, it takes me over to the Pi console. And the first thing I see here is the overview page. This gives me an idea what projects I already have running, what services I've already set up inside of Pi. So at the top, 
I'll see my visual modeling projects. We'll look into that a little bit later. Uh, visual modeling is a Pi feature that allows you to train and build a machine learning models using a drag and drop interface. So basically each uh, part of the machine learning process from data import to, to processing to uh, modeling to testing, uh, those are all represented by blocks that you can drag onto a, a little template GUI. Uh, and then you can connect those blocks together with uh, little lines to indicate the dependencies between them. So you're basically building a directed acyclic graph. Uh, notebook modeling, that's another important Pi feature. Uh, we sometimes call this Pi DSW or Data Science Workshop. In fact, you can see that it says that right here in very small font, Data Science Workshop. This sets up a online Jupyter notebook where you can run Python code. So if you want to write some customized code uh, to do something like spam sorting using a Bayesian model, and you want to use scikit-learn or, or PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, you'll probably want to use notebook modeling. And this notebook modeling allows GPU acceleration. You can set up a notebook that has a GPU card attached to it. And then finally, there's model deployment. So model deployment allows you to take the models you've created in visual modeling and notebook modeling and deploy them as an API service. So with model deployment, I can take the model I've trained and basically set up an API uh, in just a few clicks without writing any code. Uh, I can set up an API that will serve that model. So I can make the results of my model available to people as a handy API that they can incorporate into their own applications. And that model service actually is based on Alibaba Cloud API Gateway. So you can charge for API calls. You can actually set up a paid API service using model deployment. Those are the key features of Pi. Um, there are a few other neat things you can do with Pi uh, in terms of, say, uh, visual uh, machine learning tasks like tagging images or doing OCR. Uh, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, before we get into that, uh, let me just open up visual modeling and show you what it looks like. Um, so, of course, to use it, I have to create a project first. Um, I will need Max Compute set up to do that. Uh, looks like I don't have a Max Compute project set up in Beijing. Let's try another region. Let's try Shanghai. So, uh, Pi actually, uh, Pi Visual Modeling actually expects to be able to pull uh, information from uh, Max Compute tables. So, you need to have an associated project set up through DataWorks. Uh, DataWorks is how you manage Max Compute projects on Alibaba Cloud. Don't worry about that right now. We're getting a little bit deep into Alibaba Cloud's big data ecosystem here. Just know that Pi Visual Modeling wants to pull tables from this other service. So let's set up a test uh, viz model um, project. My test of Visual uh, of, of uh, GUI modeling. There we go. And we can set up with or without GPU. I, I don't need a GPU for this test, so I'll leave that off. And then we'll wait a minute for this to create. And if we have issues creating in here, we can always switch over to um, the DataWorks console and create our project there. In fact, it looks like I might need to do that. Let's try one more time. Okay, test viz model without GPU. Uh, okay, so that's not going to work. All right, so fine. So what we'll have to do is open up DataWorks over here and create a new project that enables Pi. Uh, and then we'll have a associated Max Compute project that DataWorks, or excuse me, that Pi can pull data from. And then everything should work okay. So I'll go ahead and uh, create a new project here or a new workspace here in DataWorks in Shanghai. And then once I've done that, um, this studio of modeling visualization should start working. Uh, by the way, this is not a requirement for the notebook interface. The Jupyter Notebook does not need me to set up Max Compute first. So visual pi viz test. Uh, we'll set up a basic project. You don't need to worry about what that means right now. Uh, we'll cover that hopefully in, in a future lecture. Uh, we'll, add, we'll attach Max Compute Pay as you go, and we'll link Pi. That should work. 
test pi is mp. That will be the name for my max compute project, which will be associated with this workspace here. We'll leave encryption off. You can turn on encryption for your max compute workspaces if you need to protect the data that you're going to be feeding into pi. So I'll go ahead and click create workspace here. Uh, it's been created. Great. Now I can go back to the workspace list. Now I have two workspaces. Actually, this is an old one. I can probably delete that. Maybe we'll do that later. Um, okay, so let me refresh my list here. Great, PyViz test is now showing up. So if I click on machine learning, uh, that should take me over to the Py visualization console. Um, and you can see from here, I can actually set up new experiments um, or I can create a new workflow based on an existing template. So I might want to say, set up a recommender system. So if I click create and put that under the My Experiments folder, that will set up a recommendation engine uh, workflow for me. So I can actually learn more about how to use Pi by examining some of the built-in workflows that the Pi team has put together. So in just a moment, that should finish creating. So let's wait a moment for that, see what happens. And while we're waiting for that to create, let me go back here and uh, also set up a notebook. Okay, we'll create a, a notebook. Just give me a moment here. Machine Learning Data Science Workshop, DSW Notebook. Oops, DSW can't have hyphens, notebook, test, there we go. Uh, we'll use this cheapest instance type here, two cores and four GB of RAM. Um, and we'll use the TensorFlow Ubuntu image. I could also use PyTorch if I wanted. There's a couple different system images I can use as the base for my data science workshop instance. Oh, looks like uh, it's not available in those two vSwitch regions. Let me choose another one. Security group, we'll leave that blank. And then create instance. Well, current site is not available. Okay, so I might not be able to create this in Shanghai at the moment. I might have to try a different region. You know what, let's set that up a little bit later because I have a really cool demo I want to show you in there, but it, it can wait. So first, let me go back to the visualization dashboard. So this here, this graph, is a recommendation system based on some test data that is, has already been made available by the Pi team. Um, so if I double click on these nodes, their properties will show up here in the right hand side. So I can see that uh, this is a recommendation system based on some anonymized data from it looks like Taobao. It includes user IDs, item IDs, um, activity type, and activity month. And then I'm feeding that into a bunch of custom SQL scripts to pre-process the data, and then finally uh, run it through some normalizations, and then we run it through a logistic regression classifier, and then we test to see how good a job this thing did recommending products to users. And for each of these blocks, if I click on them, uh, the side pane will open, which shows how their parameters and uh, associated variables and fields are set. Um, so I can get an idea for how I could build my own machine learning model this way. And there's even a really cool feature in here called AutoML that will automatically tune machine learning model parameters to get better performance. Okay, so that's all for the visualization interface. I think you get the general idea. I can choose a node from one of these categories, like a split node to split a data set into two pieces. I drag it onto the dashboard, and then I can drag these, these guidelines between nodes uh, to set up uh, dependencies between them. That, that's, really, that's really all there is to it. So, so now you see how that's done. So now let's do something a little bit more fun. Let's uh, get a data science workbook, a DSW node set up, and play around in the Jupyter environment. We'll use Python scikit-learn to train a system how to recognize spam email. So let's go ahead and jump into that. In this demo, I'm going to show you how we can actually build a naive Bayes spam classifier on Alibaba Cloud. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is actually go over to GitHub. I've posted instructions and some code in a Jupyter Notebook here uh, that we can use to, to perform the classification. So if you look in the 
Alibaba Cloud Academy uh, organization here, which is github.com slash alicloud dash academy. You'll see there's uh, two repositories right now. Uh, what you want to do is look in big data, this one. Uh, and inside that repository, there is an item called spam filter. Uh, that's where the spam filter code and instructions live. Um, there's an i there's a dot ipynb file. This is a uh, I, uh, a Python notebook file that you can open with Jupyter Notebook. And then there's the README, which explains how to set everything up. Um, so the first thing we need to do is create a Py DSW data science workshop environment. So there's a handy feature inside Alibaba Cloud's Py that lets you set up uh, notebooks on the cloud uh, so you don't have to run them on your local machine uh, and you can choose here i'll just show you you can you can choose your hardware specification attach a gpu there's built-in tools like tensorflow uh, and it's right here from the pi console i go to dsw notebook service and then in here i can create a new notebook instance which we will call am for spam and then i can choose does it need a gpu or not if not i'll choose cpu and then I can choose different hardware specifications. The smallest one here is two cores and four gigs of RAM. And I can either pay up front or pay as you go. I'm going to pay as you go. And you can attach additional storage in the form of a network attached storage system, uh, an NFS file system. I won't do that. I'll leave that blank because Pi comes with five gigabytes of storage by default, and that is enough. Then I'll click OK, and that will go ahead and create my instance. You can see it's in the creating state right now. If I wait a few seconds, uh, it will enter the running state. And I should point out that if you have multiple notebook instances, uh, you'll only be charged for the ones that are in the running status. If you change, if you stop the instance uh, but don't release it, um, then you won't be charged for the instance. Um, so that's that's something that's a nice feature. So you can set up multiple different uh, BSW notebooks from within Platform for AI, and you can just stop the ones you're not currently uh, using, and, and then you won't be charged for those. Let's go ahead and refresh the page, see if our new system is ready yet. <clears throat> uh, because I am in China, I chose to deploy in the Shanghai region, uh, but you could also deploy in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, or Germany. There's quite a few choices here. OK, uh, and oops, there's a little bit of Chinese here. Uh, it says that the instance is now running. Uh, so I can click on Launch DSW, and that will open up the Data Science Workshop web interface. And this is really cool. So there's a web terminal here where I can not only see and edit and interact with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, I can also open a terminal and install third-party software packages uh, you can go Python 2 or, or, or Python 3. And, and I can also create new files and folders and upload existing files and folders to the interface here. And then I'll be able to access these files and folders from any uh, Jupyter Notebooks I create. But we'll be doing that in just a second. Uh, let's figure out what to upload. So uh, from the big data spam filter folder here on GitHub, I need a copy of this code, this email model code. And then I also need some email data. So if you look at the instructions that I wrote here, uh, you can get the email data from Kaggle. There's, I have a link to a Kaggle data set. Spam and non spam messages from the spam assassin spam filter people. Uh, and I'll go ahead and download that zip file. And then I also want to get a copy of this repository here. Uh, get a copy of this IPI and file. Uh, I'll go back to the top level, big data. Code. Okay, copy that to the clipboard. See where I am. I'm in the downloads folder. I'll do get clone, and then I'll clone into this big data repository. Great. Let's open up a finder window here. I need to do a couple more things to get the data into Data Science Workshop and start playing with it. Uh, number one, I need to unpack this uh, zip file with my example emails in it. And number two, I need to create a new folder, which I'll call, I don't know. Uh, the name actually is not that important. I'll call it email sort. 
Then from this folder, from this bundle archive folder I got from Kaggle, I just copy and paste ham and spam this uh, directory into my new email sort folder. I go into big data, spam filter, and I copy this Python notebook. This includes all the code for parsing emails, reading them in, and training our final model. Great, so now I've got my ham and spam directory, which has spam and non-spam emails uh, that I can use to train and test my model. And I also have the Python notebook containing all of my model code. And that's all in this folder, email sort, which I will now compress. So I'll go ahead and turn this back into a zip archive. Great, the final folder is about eight megabytes. That's, that's okay. And now I'll click on this arrow here to go ahead and upload that to the Pi DSW console. Let me close that download bar. And I'll get an upload dialog that looks like this one. Um, once my file is uploaded, then we can go about unzipping it. So one of the cool things about the data science workshop in Pi is uh, this is running on a regular Linux machine. So you can open up a terminal tab, and then you can see things you've uploaded. See, there's my uh, zip folder that I just uploaded. And I can run common commands like, say, unzip, and that will unpack uh, all of the emails here. So we just need to wait a few moments for that process to complete. While we're waiting, we can actually open a second terminal, and we need to install a few extra tools uh, in order to parse our email messages successfully. If we take a look at the README, uh, in addition to preparing the data and the code, we have to unpack and install a few extra dependencies. Specifically, uh, we need to install uh, Scikit-Learn, Beautiful Soup, which is an HTML parsing library, and LXML, which is an HTML and XML parser tool. Um, so I need to run this command. Actually, this command needs to be updated. Uh, you need to add the dash dash user flag into this command when you run it, uh, because you don't have administrator permissions inside of DSW. You are just a regular user. So what I can do is pip install dash dash user, user and then I want ES4, LXML, and sklearn. And that will go ahead and install those three Python libraries for me. sklearn, if you're not familiar with it, is scikit-learn. It is a super, super handy Python library full of all kinds of good data processing, uh, feature extraction, and machine learning model tools. And that's what we'll actually be using to train our classifier. Um, so now all we need to do is wait for unpacking the zip file and installing these packages to finish. And a neat feature in the console in DSW is I can expand this sidebar here and get some information in near real time about CPU and memory usage on my instance. Uh, because the data science workshop interface here uh, actually runs on top of a virtual machine, a single virtual machine. Uh, and so I can see statistics about how much load that virtual machine is under. And I could uh, upgrade to a, a, a more powerful instance if I find that I'm using more CPU or memory than I thought. OK, the packages we need are now all installed. We just need to wait for the unzip process to finish. So we'll wait a couple, a few more minutes for that. While we're waiting, uh, let's have a look inside this folder here. Uh, this file, email model, our model file, our Jupyter Notebook is already uh, unpacked from the zip archive. So let's go ahead and look in there. Uh, and I'll run you through the code briefly, explain what it does. So uh, in a Jupyter Notebook, you break your code into sections. Um, this allows you to run them independent from each other. What I've done here is I have a section at the top, which will um, read in a list of the file names for my ham and spam emails. And remember, ham is not spam. Ham is the good mail that we want to keep. Spam is the bad mail we want to throw away. And then after it reads in this list of file names, it just computes for me how many spam and ham messages it found and what the ratio was between spam and ham. Uh, the next uh, module here inside of my notebook uh, actually uses Python's um, email parser, which is a built-in Python library, to go through all the, all the messages and convert them into plain text. So for, for plain text mail, this is very easy. I just return the plain text content. For multi-part emails, I go through and I find all of the text and HTML 
content that I can. And if I encounter HTML content, I use Beautiful Soup to parse it into plain text. So the objective here is to pull out the body of the email, just the body. I don't even look at the headers. Pull out the body of the email for all these spam and ham messages and convert it to plain text. Uh, and once I'm done with that process, um, this is also more processing steps here to convert things to plain text. Once I'm done with that, I can use scikit-learn. Uh, it has a class called count vectorizer, which I can use to go through the ham and spam email sets uh, and then build a dictionary uh, of, of all the words that I saw and their counts. So this will tell me how many times I saw each word in the ham and spam email sets. That's what goes into X. Uh, so this is actually a sparse matrix. And then I have to form a vector Y, which expresses for each of the columns in X, is it a ham email, a good email, or a spam email? And I know this in advance because I have that information, right? Uh, I, my emails were already sorted into ham and spam. And then once that's done, uh, we can actually go about training our model. It's very easy. We use something called Complement Naive Bayes. If you're curious about what Complement Naive Bayes is, you can look in the documentation uh, on the Scikit-Learn website. They go into a lot of detail. It's actually very good documentation. I have a link to it in the body here, I think, of my GitHub page. Um, so we fit the model. Um, after We split the, uh, the data into a test set and a training set up here. Uh, we we train our complement naive bays on our training data. Then we calculate precision and recall, which, uh, to put it in very, very oversimplified terms, is the accuracy of our model uh, using, again, built-in precision and recall, recall calculators that are part of scikit-learn. Um, and then we finally make up some fake ham and spam messages and run them through our classifier to see what it does. And of course, before I can feed them to the classifier, I have to convert I have to convert the words in each of my fake spam messages into one of these feature vectors, which is a count of how many times each word occurs. Um, so you can see I've got a fake ham message, which is like, it has a real name, it's addressed to a person, it's written in a formal, in, in a relatively informal, friendly tone. Then I've got my fake spam where it starts with, dear sir or madam, and it says you've received an invite, you know, and then it's trying to sell you something. Um, so we can test to see if the classifier can actually accurately determine which of these is spam and which is not. So let's go ahead and run this whole notebook top to bottom. It looks like our uh, extraction task here uh, is done now. Yeah, it's done. So now we can go and run this whole notebook. So I can go to run all cells. This will run the entire notebook from top to bottom. You can see we have 500 spam emails and about 2,500 ham emails. So our, our training set is 20% spam. Uh, that's actually not representative. In real life, I, I think it's the other way around. Almost 80% of email is actually spam. Uh, and then here in our second cell, uh, which we're waiting for now, when this finishes, it should dump out the raw content of one spam and one hand email for us to look at so we can make a comparison. Uh, yep, there we go. Here's the first ham message, uh, including the headers. We include the headers here. And you can say, oh, I can't reproduce this error. It looks like it's from a mailing list. Uh, and then the, the first spam message is this bizarre um, list of numbers. So we can ignore that. Um, and then in order to differentiate ham and spam, we have to develop features. OK, to do that, again, I extract the raw text so that I can ignore all that garbage and header stuff that you just saw in the raw emails. Um, once I've extracted just the content, I end up getting uh, legitimate emails that look like this and spam mails that look pretty much like that, pretty much the same, um, because this was already plain text. And then I train my model, and we calculate the precision and recall. It's very good. Uh, it's catching more than 95% of spam. It's, it's doing very, very well. And if I try it on my fake messages, I can see that it classified my ham message, my legitimate message, as zero, which is correct. Zero means it's ham. And it classified my spam message as one, which is correct. That means spam. So it's doing quite a good job. And actually, uh, this, this thing here, this spam message, looks like it's actually an artifact. 
So this is one of the cool things about DSW. Uh, you can go into the command line, like I'm doing now, go into the Hammond Spam folder, go to Spam, uh, and, and see and play with the original data. So I happen to know that there's a file in here that starts like this, 0000. Dot. That file is actually a list of the other files that are part of this spam list. It's not an email. Um, so what I can do is I can then remove that, and then I can restart my kernel and rerun all the cells. And when I do that, uh, at these middle steps here where I'm looking at the example Hammond spam emails, I should get different output because that first um, spam result was thrown off by that, that uh, non-email file that I just deleted. So I can delete and manipulate files from the command line in here uh, just as though uh, I was on my own Linux machine in my own house. All right, so great. Here's our ham message. Let's have a look at spam. Okay, so now we've got a real spam message. That's great. Um, financial history, life insurance. Okay, so they're selling you life insurance. Okay, and again, I can process those into plain text. Life insurance, why pay more? I can tell that spam right away. Uh, when I train my model now, I get even better precision and recall than I got before, and my fake messages are still classified correctly as spam for the first, spam for the second. And feel free to change these. Change this code. Write a different fake real email and a different fake spam email and see what happens. See if the classifier gets it right. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, that's all I wanted to show you. Uh, you can, of course, also take models that you build in the data science workshop and export them to Pi EAS, the Elastic Algorithm Service, which lets you take all this hard work you've done in DSW and convert it into an API service that can return judgments or classes or predictions that your model makes. So that's really cool. You can make an API endpoint here in EAS that will take this model and for any spam you feed it, it will be able to say, yes, this is spam or no, not spam, by returning, say, uh, a 0 or a 1 in an HTTP request. Okay, thank you very much for joining me for the demo. Uh, again, I encourage you to check out the, the instructions and the code here on our GitHub page, Ali Cloud Academy, uh, to make sure that you have a better understanding of how this all works, play around with it a little bit more. And uh, again, thank you, and I'll see you in the next demo. Actually, you know what? Uh, rather than having another demo, since it's already been about 45, 15 minutes, let's give James an opportunity to talk a little bit about what the Academy is and what we can do to help you take better advantage of the cloud, and in particular, Alibaba Cloud. So James, take it away. Hi. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm on unmute here. My video is playing. Um, it's looking okay. Let me just confirm. We're doing all right. Um, hi, uh, my name is James Fitzgerald, and I am on the training team with Jeremy Peterson, who is just presenting to you all. Um, and I work uh, on the online operations team, so I am focusing on providing online courses, uh, particularly certification courses uh, that you guys can take online. Um, to learn more about cloud and in particular, uh, Alibaba cloud. Um, so uh, thanks again for, for Jeremy um, for sharing um, not only the background of Alibaba, um, Alibaba cloud, but really jumping into the console uh, with us uh, to show us around because that is, that is where the magic begins. Um, I just wanted to, in like about 10 minutes, um, first, give you some more thoughts about projects that you might start um, concerning machine learning, um, and then just give you a little introduction to, um, to uh, Alibaba Cloud's course offerings for machine learning. So let me first share my screen. One second. Okay, that should be, oh, okay. Should be seeing my screen there. Um, cool, so yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my, my interest in, in machine learning, machine learning projects in particular. 
Um, Jeremy gave you some of the more technical details about how to get started, uh, but maybe some of you guys are, are, are still wondering sort of where to go with this. Um, maybe you have an idea of what machine learning does, um, but not exactly sure how it applies to um, things you're either working on professionally or working on just uh, through your interest. Um, and so, so I just put this list together. I was just sort of brainstorming, me and my team were just brainstorming about um, some cool uh, ideas that you could have uh, concerning machine learning. Um, and, and these are just some industries that I put, put out here. So maybe I'll give you a little introduction into what we're thinking and hopefully can inspire some of you guys to um, uh, jump on a project um, on our platform for artificial intelligence. Um, so, so for art, for, for your artists out there, um, I, I know you're on, you're on many cell phone apps probably that do filtering and stuff, uh, but now we're creating algorithms that like cartoonify things, um, taking a standard image um, of a person um, and turning it into a cartoon. Um, and you can imagine the more times you do this, the more cartoony or more accurate to a cartoon it would look, um, the more images you feed through the algorithm, um, uh, the machine can learn how to uh, take certain features and turn them into the, the right like corresponding um, cartoon feature. Um, real estate, right? So we we're giving tons of data about housing. Um, and you know, if you were someone who's looking to buy or sell real estate, um, you, could, you could think about, okay, in a few months, given this set of data and what we've seen in the past, um, in a few months, what would this uh, this this property be worth? Um, and and a machine through through reading all old data sets and, and learning from them um, would able to give you a more accurate prediction, maybe than um, a normal just a, a normal algorithm. Um, transportation. This is something that Alibaba Cloud had worked on before, um, but I think has a lot more potential to be dove into, considering um, you know more and more cities in the world are getting clogged up. Um, and, and and Jeremy talked about it a little bit too with the with the city brain and the uh, traffic jam uh, management, uh, but also toll booth management is the one that I thought of. Um, it, you can imagine getting on and off the the super highways, um, you know, during during peak hours of most traffic, you want to have the most uh, toll booths open, um, and when there's less cars, you want to close more to save costs on um, keeping lanes open. So sort of being able to predict to predict and manage um, the opening and closing of toll booths and toll booth lanes um, is certainly something a machine, uh, a machine learning algorithm could help with. Um, similar to housing prediction in the finance world, like loan prediction, um, being able to put in a ton of loans into, into a machine um, and sort of get a better idea of what, what, uh, what sort of interest rates you would expect um, in the future. Um, and also for people that you are loaning to, this would be interesting for a financial company, would be able to profile your, your users to say, okay, these people are more or less likely um, to return the loan on time. Um, people, I, I was reading about people in, in uh, Western Europe um, using machine learning to do wine quality um, based on when the grapes were harvested, um, you know, like kind of what machines they were using, what time of year, that sort of thing. I'm um, trying to put in the data of all of the wine that was good and all of the wine that was bad, um, sort of uh, help having the machine build an algorithm to decide, okay, if we pick the grapes at this time um, during this season and do this process, um, we'll be able to have sort of like the best wine result. Um, uh, psychology, I think this is pretty interesting when um, machines start analyzing humans, um, but um, I think it's certainly something that the, um, that the psychology and the therapy world would be, would be very interested in, um, is being able to put a ton of case studies of patients um, into, um, into a machine and be able to um, maybe not even just uh, predict behavior, but be able to diagnose more accurately. Um, as, as the brain is still a very complicated place, um, even for the psychology world, um, maybe machines can help us get some better answers or at least find um, some patterns between uh, mental diseases. Um, toys, I put, I put in quote the Barbie brain because that's uh, something that's sort of being developed, but we can think of toys sort of more a more large scale. Um, toys are obviously super fun for kids, um, but are, could be used as tools in the future, um, not only to make things more fun, but we see a lot of toys becoming educational tools for, for kids. Um, and and this, this is really interesting because, you know, this is delivering 
um, more education to kids in a way that they are having fun and enjoying. Um, and so that is, there's a lot of potential in the education world. And that, you know, I'm, I'm, I personally know some people who are involved in these projects of creating more tools um, for that, that younger age group um, to, to learn more from. Um, and I think there's the, you know, a, a machine learning, of course, I mean, you're talking, you know, about artificial intelligence and robots, you can imagine um, a small toy robot um, being a great companion and being a great educator for, for a kid. Um, and, and that's, and that's pretty exciting to think about. And then of course, like you can just do machine learning projects for fun, right? Like there's tons of different data sets out there, um, that are just like available and just to maybe hone your skills or, um, create a quirky form or something like that. Um, you can always run, you know, machine learning algorithms, um, to make fun things. Um, one, one project I saw was uh, the Titanic prediction. So I think you input your, um, your class, like you know, what class you stayed on in the Titanic, uh, where you stayed in the boat, something like this. Um, and you a couple other little facts about you, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, are you an immigrant or are you, um, on travel, something like this. And then it would sort of like predict, um, um based on, on, on what happened actually during the Titanic. Um, uh, whether you survive or not. Um, so, you know, feel free to have fun with it too. Um, but, and so I just drew this little, uh, really simple, simplified flow chart, uh, looking at Jeremy's uh, visualization within Pi. Obviously it goes a lot deeper than this, but we can generally think of uh, a machine learning algorithm um, to be one that learns based on the results that it, in, uh, it outputs. Um, so that, this arrow here on the left, that learning part is the really the key part for the, the machine learning part of the learning, right? Otherwise, it's just a machine where we're just putting an input and an output comes. Um, so any, any, any opportunity where you see uh, some sort of result being able to inform the process uh, might be something that would be good for um, a machine learning algorithm to tackle, um, to try out. Cool. So those are my ideas. Then I just wanted to give you guys uh, just sort of a, a starting point here uh, to, to jump off on. Um, if you're curious to learn more about machine learning, um, Alibaba Cloud Academy is now offering um, a handful of courses just focused on machine learning. Um, particularly, and this is, this is the one I'd like to highlight, is the machine learning um, specialty. Uh, it's about 12 hours, 12, 16 hours of courses. Um, it comes with a certification. Um, and it really, um, it really breaks down in more detail um, what sort of what Jeremy was going through today um, in, the, in the Pi demos and gives you more examples. And also I really like the specialty too, and it's sort of different than our other specialties because it goes into the logic and the mathematics of creating a machine learning algorithm, talking about decision trees and regression algorithms. Um, so if all of that stuff is interesting to you, um, sort of like the math behind it, um, the machine learning specialty has a ton of great courses uh, for, for those people that are interested in that. Um, and then I put uh, three, three smaller level, also certification courses on the bottom there. Um, machine learning for beginners, linear regression. So like I was saying, we, we actually do dive into some of the math there behind uh, creating a linear, linear regression model. Um, and then uh, this second one is uh, about heart disease, heart disease prediction, sort of similar to some of the ideas that I gave before, trying to predict um, sort of outcomes of certain heart diseases. Um, so we run through that case um, with you in that course. Um, and then supporting vector machine implementation through Pi. Um, so this is more specific sort of use case of Pi. Um, if you are sort of getting into Pi and want to learn more about different things you can do. Okay, so those are the links there. Um, and and uh, so so actually today we're, we, we were, uh, we're fortunate uh, to be able to give out um, coupons to this machine learning specialty. Um, so after this uh, session has ended, um, there will be instructions on how to redeem a code for this machine learning specialty. Um, I'm seeing there's only 20 people here and then we have like 50 codes. So all of you guys are welcome to jump on it. Um, you know, first come first serve on the machine learning specialty. Um, if this interests you, why not, you know, jump in the class, um, see if this is something you can continue to grow on. Okay. So yeah, that's, um, that's all I wanted to share today. I, I didn't want to be too long. Um, good. I kept it sort of like 10 minutes. I just wanted to share some ideas with you guys 
um, and to, to sort of drum up hopefully some inspiration uh, for any machine learning projects that you're thinking about undertaking. Um, this Apsara talk is part of a series of Apsara talks. Um, we are planning at least three more episodes. So there will be every month. So if this is fun for you, please stay tuned. We're gonna be doing more. Um, and these Apsara talks will be focused mostly around like hot topics that developers are interested in um, and, and, and hopefully uh, breaking ground into new uh, fields that uh, you otherwise were not so familiar with. And I hope Alibaba Cloud and our product line um, can help you start that journey. Okay, so uh, that's it. I'm going to uh, I'm going to take off now. Um, I, I actually can take any questions. I'm here in the chat. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can sort of stick around for a few minutes. Um, Hi James. Oh hey hey hey. How you Hi doing? James. Uh, my name hey. is Veros. Uh, I'm not a developer, but I'm a business owner. So I like to understand, like for example, I have an application now that manages a fleet of ships. All right, so. Um, uh, it's based on PHP and MySQL. So if let's say I want to implement AI, um, how do I go about doing it or integrating it? Do I have like to pass the data over to the uh, the algorithm or the, the machine that you have and right. then uh, import back the data and how do I do it real time? So like how do like people like Uber and Grab does it? That's my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so yeah, the, the, you're, you're kind of wondering about real time data set inputting. Um, and I, th yeah. I think once you're once you're inside Pi, um, and and I encourage you to to take these classes because the details are detailed. Um, once you're in Pi, you can give it a um, give it a data set that it can it can regularly check on um, to see if that is updated. And then sort of through the visual um, thing that Jeremy showed during his demo, you can see if that flow is working right for you. But it, there would be some sort of migration from whatever platform you're on now, um, either the, the algorithm that you built, you'd probably migrate over to Pi. Um, and, then, uh, and then the data set itself, yeah, you would set to a reoccurring check to see if there is, is new uh, on that. And if the data itself is on the cloud and obviously Pi um, is also on the cloud, then that can be real time. All right, thank you very much for your yeah. explanation. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Wilmos. Hi, Wilmos. Hi, Wilmers. Do you want to unmute and ask the question instead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go for it. Yes, yes, Wilmos. Yes, we, we, we highly encourage you to build your own algorithm. Um, there's a lot of source coding that we offer on GitHub um, to get you going, uh, but yeah, but the key is is that you're you're creating an algorithm that you know is 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 built for you, um, and so and so so yeah yeah that that that's what we're inspiring you to do almost go build something that doesn't exist. Anyone has any more questions for James? You're welcome. Thank you, Wilmos. Cool. Yeah. If you guys have you know something you think of in the middle of the night, um, feel free to email me. Let me put my email address here in the chat. I'm always very happy to have a conversation with any of you um, about your journey. Um, feel free to email me, feel free to email Claudine. Um, 
Yeah, definitely all of you guys email Claudine first for those codes so you can just jump in those classes. Um, and then, you know, if you have any more questions about machine learning, Alibaba Cloud, anything, feel free to email me. Happy to talk. Okay. I think I think that's all for today. Thank you, James and Jeremy, and thank you everyone for attending today's session. Um, our next session will be next month, so keep a lookout or follow us on LinkedIn, TikTok, or Telegram uh, for the latest update. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye James. Bye, Bye everyone.